Does this mic work now? Okay. Can everyone hear me at the back? Is that good? Okay. Technology-wise in the front, because we're live streaming this on Facebook, is this also working? Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Just interrupt me if you can't hear anything. Okay. I hate microphones that have a cable, so we'll see how that goes today. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk you, to you about um, basically the foundation of the work that I'm doing. And um, I'm sort of trying to get you interested in a specific um, aspect of, of astrophysics. And I'm going to talk about Newton stars today. So um, the aspect that I'm going to talk about is how we can use these objects to use them as cosmic laboratories. And um, well, typically when we talk about a physics laboratory, it looks something like this. So I actually went to three different physics um, groups at McGill and just looked at their websites and how their experiments look like. So if you do something like terahertz physics and you're looking at lasers at a specific frequency, your setup could look something like this. If you are in a um, biophysics group and you look at molecules, um, then you work with uh, microscopes and you, you could have a setup that looks something like this. Or if you work in an ultra-cold um, group that studies like behaviors of matter at very low temperatures, you could have a cryostate like this, okay? So that's typically what a physics laboratory looks like. So I'm an astrophysicist. That's kind of the, the elements of my laboratory, okay? So in principle, I'm trying, or most of the observations that I'm using are actually not done by myself, but other people use telescopes to observe a specific part of space um, and then I combine this with mathematical equations and computer simulations to try and understand a specific aspect of the universe, okay? So this is actually my desk, those two pictures. So that, that's how, how, how my workspace looks like, okay? So nothing like this at all. Um, in principle, there's a lot of aspects in the universe that you can look at, but I am interested in one specific one of them, okay? And I find them incredibly exciting because Newton stars, and I will tell you in a bit what they are, um, unite many extremes of physics. Um, and these extremes are so extreme that we can actually not recreate them on Earth. Okay? And because of these extremes that we have somewhere in the universe, we can essentially try and test how matter behaves, how physics works, and maybe even come up with new theories. So we're going to sort of talk about three different elements. So we're first going to talk about what are these extremes. Then I'm going to try and like convince you why I think that these extremes are actually there and they exist. And then I'm going to sort of link this back to what's happening in the interior of the Newton star and how we can use that to understand um, about the physics of these objects. So this is an astrophysics night and I do a lot of astrophysics. So this side of the, the whole talk will be like the astro side of it. And this side would be more the physics side. So, um, well, we will combine a lot of different things um, and I'll take you on a, on a bit of a journey through, through all the stuff that I do. If there's a few more seats down here, if you wanna just come in and sit down. Maybe like, if there's like several seats, like there's still get gaps in the middle, maybe you can just move in so that there's some more space for the people at the back. Okay, um, so we're starting with what are these extremes? So Newton stars are compact objects that are essentially born when stars that are something like 20 times as massive as the sun run out of fuel and collapse. So they shed out their entire outer layers and produce these um, amazing filamentary structures that we can observe and they look, for example, like this. So um, the Crab Nebula, that was a supernova uh, in 1054, we have records of that from Chinese astrom astronomers. Um, an optical looks like something like this. So you have these massive filamentary structures. Um, and somewhere in the center here is a Newton star, much, much, much smaller. Um, another object like this, that's actually the, the background of the types of sites, one of my favorite pictures, um, is the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant that was created by a supernova that should have become visible on Earth something like uh, in the 1600s, okay? So these structures are on really, really, really big scales. Um, and in the center of these um, objects, we, we end up with something that um, is what we call a Newton star. So Newton stars have about the mass of the sun, but they are the size of Montreal, okay? So I'm, this is the sun, um, and 
you could, I hope you be somewhere, let's see, down here. And so this is uh, Montreal and Laval. And um, this is just to give you a scale. So this is the size of a neutron star, okay? So imagine that we put this in the, uh, um, in this small amount of space, but it has the, the mass of the sun, okay? So that, those are really, really, really different scales. Okay, so um, I would generally say that physicists are not particularly creative when it comes to naming things. So a neutron star is called a neutron star because it consists mainly of neutrons, okay? So um, if you, if you look at like these kind of sizes of volumes and um, this mass, you can calculate the density of these objects. And if you do that, you find out that they are the densest objects that we actually know of. Um, to give you an idea how dense they are, you take every single human being on the earth, you violate every eth ethics uh, violation that you can possibly have, and you compress them into the size of a sugar cube, okay? So if you do that, you end up with something that's about 10 to the 15 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay, so you will see a lot of numbers that have 10 to the power of another number. What that means is it's just a one with that many zeros, okay? So in this case, that's the one with 15 zeros. I have no idea how to say this in English. <laughs> I don't even know if that is. Um, so these densities are so high that they are actually um, exceeding the densities of the atomic nuclei that we have in every single atom on Earth, okay? So this is denser than everything that we can create in experiments on Earth, and that is some of the, the fascinating aspect of these stars in general. On top of being small, very dense, um, these stars also rotate, okay? And they rotate incredibly quickly and very stable. Um, and the typical period that, um, or typical frequency that you get out of this is something like your typical kitchen blender, if you use a very good one. Um, so they rotate something like 700 times per second, the fastest one that we know of, okay? Another really extreme property of Newton stars is that they are the strongest magnets that we know of, okay? So this is an artist's illustration um, of a Newton star. This is something, well, it could look like this if you get close enough. Um, and you see these like, um, lines here, that's essentially the magnetic field, or an illustration of the magnetic field lines. And you might know this um, kind of structure from standard dipole magnets that you might have seen at some point in high school, maybe. So um, the Newton story is essentially this huge um, magnetic dipole, um, where this is the, just the magnetic axis in this case. Um, and on top of this, it rotates. So the field strength of these is something like another large number. 10 to the 12th Gauss. Um, Gauss is just the unit of fields that we use, but um, that might not tell you a lot, but you can convert this maybe to something that you have a better understanding of, which is the, the um, Earth's magnetic field. And if you take the Earth's magnetic field, you would have to multiply it by a two with 12 zeros to get to a similar field strength, okay? So it's also much, much, much larger than anything that we can create on Earth. Um, and uh, again, another reason why Newton stars are ex as extreme as they are. Okay, so I've, I've told you about four extremes. So um, you might want to ask, well, how do you know these things? So we can observe Newton stars. So um, although they are kind of this like compact small object that um, has lost all its fuel um, and doesn't radiate like the sun anymore, it still emits um, small amounts of radiation um, and we, I'm going to talk about two different ones. So um, if you have never seen um, the electromagnetic spectrum, this is how it looks like, okay? So we have um, short wavelengths over here or high frequencies, they just inver inverse to each other, um, and long wavelengths and um, low f uh, high frequencies, low frequencies over here, sorry. So um, to like relate this to things that you know, on in this range, we have something like x-rays, so you get, if you get your bones x-rayed, then um, you would end up with something that has like 10 to the minus 10 meters in wavelength, or if you use it, your, we all use this a lot, um, the internet, um, 
Wi-Fi, this all sits in something like the radio um, range where we have um, something like on the order of a meter wavelength, okay? Of course, optical is, is where we all see stuff. Okay, so Newton stars can be observed in the radio wave band. Um, and that's quite fortunate for us because imagine this is outer space, this is the atmosphere, and there is electromagnetic radiation coming from these objects to us. A lot of the different wavelengths are actually um, absorbed in the atmosphere, okay? So they cannot pass through, which is really good for us as human beings because it absorbs a lot of the, the, the gamma rays that, for example, the sun creates, and it kind of protects us um, from, from solar flares and things like that. Um, but the atmosphere is transparent to a part of the radio band, so you can essentially observe um, Newton stars in the radio band um, from Earth if you have radio telescopes. And that's actually how Newton stars were first observed. So in 1967, Jocelyn Bell Burnell um, was a graduate student in Cambridge in the UK, and she um, was um, heavily involved in constructing a radio telescope. Okay? That is actually the radio telescope, what looks like washing lines. That's kind of what it is. So you have like a lot of like washing lines next to each other, um, and they pick up this this radio signal from space. And she was a graduate student at the time, and she um, okay, um, she basically looked at um, recorded chart data and saw that the data has these blips in it. Okay. And um, she realized that that's actually the signal from a Newton star. So Newton stars emit um, radio waves because they have fast rotation and a magnetic field. And those two axes are not aligned with each other, but they have some kind of misalignment angle. Okay? And as soon as you have that, what you essentially get is like a lighthouse effect, where um, if the beam sweeps over you, you see the object pulse very much like a lighthouse. So you can imagine this um, with this illustration. So you have the pulsar that rotates um, uh, with an axis that's parallel to, to the board and a magnetic field line that's misaligned. And every time the sweep sweeps over the Earth, we see this blip go up, okay? So that's exactly the radio pulse that they observed in their original radio data. Okay, so that means, for example, if this beam does not sweep over you, then you don't observe anything. Okay, so that was the original signal they, they saw. Um, and despite the fact that they figured out it's something like a period of 1.3 seconds, so, every, so basically they just counted the, the distance between those blips, um, and they figured out pretty quickly afterwards that it was actually a Newton star, they termed it or nicknamed it LGM1 first, um, which stands for Little Green Man, okay? So astronomers do have a bit of a sense of humor from time to time. Um, but it was not ET, it was actually the signal from a Newton star from outer space. Okay, so that was the first pulsar that we observed. Today we have much more sophisticated um, radio telescopes. Um, that's a picture of Arecibo um, that you might um, all know from the Golden Eye James Bond movie. That's essentially just a huge radio dish that just looks up and sees everything that passes over it. Um, and with these kind of um, telescopes, not just that, but a lot of other ones all over the world, we've detected about 2,700 Newton stars as these kind of radio pulsars today. And I said earlier that their rotation is incredibly stable. And because of the stability, we, we do something that we call, we time the pulsar. So it's essentially like using a stop clock, and every time you see a pulse, you stop, and then you do this in, for, for a large number of pulses, you can essentially like um, get the period, so the, um, the time it takes um, between those two blips out of the observations. But if you do this for long enough, you can also determine the derivative. So the derivative is, is essentially the rate of change of the period over a specific amount of time, okay? So the period is not constant, but it actually changes because the Newton star loses energy. And for several objects, well, for about two and a half thousand um, that we know of, 
we can actually determine the period and the period derivative and plot that uh, on a diagram. Okay, so every single point here is a Newton star and you should see three different colors. So there's this object down here, there's a large lump of black dots here and then there's blue squares up here in the upper right corner. So um, we like plotting these parameters in this kind of way because it tells us a bit about the distribution of these objects in that specific space. Um, and we usually typically, well, what you do by eyes, well, you, you say there's a large lump here, you can maybe circle those and you, you would suggest that, that would suggest maybe those are similar, have similar properties, maybe they're similar types. Um, those down here are slightly different, so maybe that's another type, and then there's this few up here. And that's actually the case, we do think now this is sort of like different types of neutron stars that we know of, um, because if you have the period derivative, so the rate of change and the period itself, you can essentially deduce the age of the pulsar, the neutron star, and the magnetic field strength by using a couple of equations. And the lines that you see here, so those ones, those are lines of the same magnetic field. So all the pulsars that lie in the same lines have the same magnetic field strength. High is up here, low is down here. Whereas the other angle, those are the pulsars of the same age. So these pulsars are young, they have the same characteristic age, and these pulsars are older. Um, and the three different types that I've um, put on here um, are, well, we call those normal pulsars or rotation powered pulsars because rotation is the main driver for their features that we observe. Whereas those up here um, is what we call magnetars. Magnetars are just neutron stars that are strongly magnetized, okay? So they have really high magnetic fields. They're actually um, a thousand times larger than the field strength I gave you earlier. So they're really, really, really high. Um, magnetic field strength. Whereas those down here um, are relatively old um, and they typically come with a companion, so they're in a binary system. Um, and down here, a lot of the physics of the system is influenced by the interaction with the second object that it has. Specifically, those um, companion systems, um, if you time this pulsar very well and you're able to sort of track its evolution, um, you will figure out that the companion actually influences the pulsar itself. And it doesn't just influence the pulsar, but also the actual pulse that I can observe. Okay? So um, it's possible to write down maths equations, and by tracking this pulsar really well, you can essentially extract things like the mass of the pulsar from those kind of measurements. Okay? So it's not that easy to do that. Um, but for the objects that we have observed for several like decades, like 30, 40 years, we actually get estimates of the mass um, of these objects out of it. Um, and then you get something, like I said earlier, something that's like, so the, the, some of the largest we know is about two solar masses. So it weighs twice as much as the sun, okay? Okay, so that's how we, we can estimate the mass. Um, on top of emitting in the radio band, neutron stars also emit um, X-rays, okay? So, I said earlier we can observe um, radio waves on Earth because the tr atmosphere is transparent. The Earth is not transparent to um, X-rays, okay? So, to observe um, X-rays, we need to go to space. And this is um, uh, an X-ray space telescope. So this is an artist's imp impression of the Chandra X-ray telescope um, that is, among other things, observing neutron stars. So um, what the radiation that we observe from, from Chandra, for example, is um, essentially the thermal radiation of the neutron star. And the neutron star, you can imagine like a black body. So some of you might have like maybe heard this. What this means is essentially what the word means. So it's black because it does not reflect any of the radiation that's, um, uh, that you shine on it, but the only thing that you see is essentially its thermal radiation. You just measure its temperature. Um, and um, astronomers love black body radiation because it has a very characteristic shape, and the only parameter that um, enters this is the temperature. So you have these like peaks and height, so you basically just plot the wavelength that I showed you earlier, um, that's just the number that you have here. Um, and you can calculate the energy that is emitted by this black body. 
and then you get out a characteristic shape. And um, the higher the temperature is, the more this increases and the more the peak goes to the left. Okay, so for the Newton star, where we see the black body radiation in um, X-rays, we can deduce that the temperature is something like 10 to the 7 degrees Celsius. Okay, 10 to the 7 is um, 10 with another six zeros. So by looking at this black body radiation from Newton stars, we can, um, well, this is just a, just a number, but um, in reality, this has a bit more features. So you can essentially learn more about the temperature. And if you do this really carefully and you compare this to your theoretical models, then you can also extract the radii of the Newton star. Okay, But that's, in general, a very difficult process, um, and we don't get these numbers very well. Okay, so those are the extremes that I talked about. So um, what does that tell us about the interior? So um, Newton stars are essentially layered objects, um, very much like the Earth, although the scale of the different layers is very different. So Newton stars have... Um, an atmosphere that's composed of mainly hydrogen, helium, and carbon. And the atmosphere is very thin because these objects are very dense, so that means they have a very strong gravitational attraction, which essentially means that they pull the atmospheric layers very close to them. Newton stars have an outer crust. So they actually have a crust, as in the sense uh, of what the word means. So there's an iron lattice, um, and that's permeated by, by electrons on top of that. And they have an inner crust, where you have the same thing as in the outer crust, but on top of that, you have um, free neutrons that move around in this lattice as well. Um, if you go further inwards, you hit the outer core, where you no longer have a, an iron lattice, but instead now you have what we call um, uh, nuclear matter. So you essentially have a sea of neutrons, protons, and electrons. Then you are somewhere here. And now we get even further to the interior, then we hit the inner core, and there's a question mark here because we actually don't know what's going on there. Okay? Um, several people think they know what those question marks are, but we currently have no way of saying if that's correct or not. So um, I just showed you these different layers. This picture is not to scale. It looks a bit more like this. So the crust is something like a kilometer um, in size, whereas the core, the whole of the core, so those two layers together, is something like nine kilometers. Um, the thing is that we actually don't know exactly where these, what we call interfaces, are. Um, we also don't know what this here is. Um, and the reason for that is that we don't know what the so called equation of state is. Okay? So, um, the Newton star matter, as I said earlier, is so extreme in various ways that it's denser than the um, atomic nucleus that we can have on Earth. So remember all the humans together in a sugar cube, okay? That's so high that we actually don't know what's going on there. So we don't know how matter behaves at such high densities. Um, and that's typically described as the so-called equation of state. So equation of state of a material essentially describes um, if I have um, specific parameters, how does the material behave? So that could, for example, be if you have a liter um, of air and you compress that, then you can exactly tell what the density is. Okay? We don't know how that relationship works for the Newton star matter. Um, that might be a bit of a, of a difficult way of saying it. Maybe a more intuitive way could be saying, um, I don't know what the radius of the star is if I give it a specific mass, okay? So if I say it has two solar masses versus it has one solar mass, I don't know what radius that corresponds to, okay? Um, and that's one of the key unknowns of Newton's star astrophysics that we have, and theorists have been trying for a very long time to come up with these equations of state that describe how the matter actually behaves, okay? So don't get scared by this plot. I just want to show you how science sometimes works because this kind of summarizes our understanding of what the equation of state looks like. An equation of state should be one line on this plot. Okay? 
there is loads of them. They typically have these like um, abbreviations. They typically named after the people that came up with that specific model and how, how meta should behave. Um, so these are all theoretical predictions. They are all over the place. Um, and people now start to like try and constrain these by, for example, measuring the masses of the objects that I said earlier. So those are three measured masses of uh, mutant stars that we have. So in principle, you kind of have to, well, if your curve doesn't hit this a real object that we observe, you might want to go back and try and figure out if you've done something wrong, because it can't explain something that we can actually observe. Okay? I said earlier, measuring radii is really difficult. That's why there is no real constraint like on the x-axis here. But the cool thing would be if you can measure a radius for an object where you have the mass, you essentially um, end up with a specific point, which would mean that all the theorists have to kind of come up with a line that has to match that point, okay? That's why people um, that work in this field really like keen on um, measuring these radii of neutron stars. Another way of saying this is that we have no clue how squishy neutron stars are, okay? Essentially, if you give me Newton star matter between my fingers, apart from the fact that that's a bit difficult, but um, I don't know if it's very spongy and I can just squish it together or if it's completely like resisting that, okay? That's just exaggerating that process. So we have no real idea how that works in the case of the Newton star. And that's why we um, struggle in some form to actually make predictions on how the interior behaves, okay? That's real life science. We don't have an answer yet. Um, there's various telescopes out there that are exactly trying to, to probe this, um, this, this field and like see if they can pit, uh, pin down a radius for a specific mass, but that's science that's happening right now, okay? Okay, you, you might think, okay, that's very depressing. We don't know anything, but we do know something. Okay, now we're going back to like proper physics. Okay, um, so I said earlier that the, the Newton star has neutrons, protons, and electrons predominantly in its interior. Um, and these kinds are elementary particles. Um, and typically when we um, look at elementary particles, we can um, separate them into two classes, okay? There is so-called fermions and bosons. They are named after um, people, Fermi and Bose, so that we can remember who these people are. Um, and the difference between these particles is that fermions have um, a spin that's given by half an integer, so um, 0.5, 1.5, 2.5. Spin is essentially um, a way, a science way of saying this thing is rotating. Whereas bosons have an, uh, ra <laughs> either zero spin or they have an integer spin, okay? One, two, and three. Nature now does fundamentally different things to these kind of particles. So the neutrons and the protons and uh, electrons in the Newton star are fermions with a spin of one half. And particles like this have to obey what's called the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, who has heard of Pauli exclusion principle? Okay, that, that's a third, that's good. Okay. Okay, um, so what does that mean? Imagine that I have a large number of fermions and bosons and I cool them to very low temperatures. Those two types of particles will do fundamentally different things. So if I do this to bosons that have an integer or zero spin, what they do is they will all move to the lowest state that they can possibly occupy, okay? So these different lines is what we call quantum states, but um, just imagine this as they all um, like to get together and end up down here in the lowest state possible. Fermions do something completely different. So um, fermions um, can only always occupy um, a quantum state um, if, with a particle if that has completely different properties, okay? So two fermions that have the same properties cannot be in the same space at the same time, okay? So um, for electrons, for example, the picture would be the lowest quantum state is occupied by one electron. That's fine. It's a one specific space at a, a one specific space at a specific point in time, and that particle now has spin one half. Um, the good thing is 
you can do this spin thing in two directions. Okay, so you can have a spin up and a spin down. So you can add another particle that has spin down to the same quantum state. But now it's full. Now you have to go to the next quantum state that um, in this case has a higher energy. So you basically fill up your space by always putting two particles, two fermions, um, into these, onto these um, shelves essentially um, until you've gotten rid of all of them. Okay? So there's, this is what we call the Pauli exclusion principle. So um, a bit more in a scientific way is that two particles that um, occupy the same quantum state cannot have the same quantum numbers. So quantum numbers is, for example, the spin number that we have. Um, so this is essentially a quantum mechanical principle, um, and it has a direct consequence for neutron stars. So imagine now I have, um, well, we have eight here. Imagine now I try and put these eight in a very small space. The thing is, is that they will essentially resist that compression, okay? So resisting compression is um, equivalent to saying that these, they have a pressure, and we call that the generacy pressure. Um, and what essentially means is that um, because of this Pauli exclusion principle, the neutron star and the neutrons have a specific pressure attached to them, which is um, responsible for preventing the star from collapsing. Okay? I said earlier, this thing weighs as much um, as twice the sun, is really small. So in principle, if you just have look at the gravitational force that that exerts, that would make that thing collapse. Okay? And the thing that keeps it from collapsing is exactly Pauli's exclusion principle. Okay? So that's a direct manifestation um, of, of quantum mechanics um, in the Newton star. So, um, now that we know these objects are actually stable, what else can we say about their interior? And I said earlier that they are something like 10 to the 7, so 10 with the six zeros, um, hot. That's for us really hot. I mean, we live at level right now at like minus 15, but generally like zero temperature is something that we feel com comfortable with. So if you like turn that up a lot, that seems like a huge number to us, okay? For Newton stars, that's actually cold because they are as dense as they are. Because they have such high densities, um, humanity in sugar cube, um, we can actually start forming new quantum mechanical phases inside the Newton star. And they typically appear as soon as I go through a specific temperature, which is what we call transition temperature. You probably more familiar with a transition temperature or a phase transition in that sense, um, when you go from this to this. So um, that's a very classic phase transition that all of us have sort of experienced, where you have water and you cool that down and you end up with a lot of snow, specifically in Montreal. Okay, so that's a phase transition where at some temperature, suddenly something completely different happens to the matter and there's suddenly very different properties, very different to what it does in the liquid state. So um, the neutrons and the protons in the neutron star interior s do undergo a similar phase transition, okay? Um, and they do that by using two neutrons, so two fermions that are neutrons, or two protons and combining them together into a pair, um, which is what we call poop, Cooper pair after the person that came up with that kind of concept. Um, and once you have formed these pairs, you essentially form new quantum mechanical states that are superfluid or superconducting states, okay? And those might be words that you might have heard um, from experiments on Earth or from actual materials. So what are these things for people that have never heard these uh, expressions? So superfluids, um, very much like the, the word super and fluid says, are fluids that are incredibly exciting because they flow without viscosity. Okay. Viscosity is essentially a parameter that describes how uh, viscous something is. So um, for example, you compare um, uh, a classical um, example for viscosity is when you use honey. So it's very like non-runny. Okay. That is essentially a, a way to say something is viscous. Um, so a superfluid has zero viscosity. 
Superconductors, on the other hand, have um, a zero electrical resistivity because they are perfect conductors, as in they are superconductors. And on top of that, they don't only just have vanishing resistivity, but they also, um, on top of that, try to expel their magnetic field, which is another characteristic properties of superconductors. These two that we see typically in experiments on Earth, and we've like known about superconductivity since 19... Uh, since the 1910s and superfluids yeah, a couple of decades later, they're essentially a direct result of quantum mechanics. Um, and we typically call this like a macroscopic manifestation of, of quantum mechanics. Um, and we usually use this expression for um, laboratory experiments where we work with like something that's like several centimeters. Newton stars have these components as well, but they on the order of the size of Montreal. Okay? So they're the biggest superconductors and superfluids that we know of and they're huge. So what's the, the important thing about these properties of, of Newton stars? So um, superfluids, because they have no viscosity, essentially if I try and like touch it, the, the superfluid doesn't react to that, um, cannot rotate like a classical fluid. Because if I, for example, have a bucket with water in it, I spin the bucket, then the water of the surface will basically be dragged along with um, uh, water. So it will dragged along with the, the motion, and the fluid will subsequent, subsequently spin up. That's the exact same concept as you, for example, have when you use a spoon and you want to stir your coffee. Okay, so you can actually like stir up your, your fluid in the in the normal fluid coffee case. So superfluids cannot do that, but we do know that they rotate, so how do they do that? Um, and the cool thing is that people in um, the, the 40s figured out that superfluids actually rotate by forming what we call vortices. Okay? Vortices are essentially what you can envisage as a tiny rapidly rotating tornado, something like this. Um, it has a circular flow um, and typically what we call an eye in the middle, so there's no flow in the interior, the exact same concept translates to the superfluid case in the Newton star, but well, as this has like a diameter of something like 30 meters, in the case of the Newton star, this is on the scale of something like Fermi, that's 10 to the minus 15. So now we have a one and you put the zeros to the left of that. Okay, so that's quantum mechanical length scale, that's tiny. So the cool thing is that each of these vortices carries a unit of circulation. So what that means is each vortex has a specific rotation attached to it. So the more vortices I have, the faster that whole thing is rotating. Okay? And if I look at a specific system where I have a lot of vortices that are typically arranged in this, what we call a hexagonal structure, um, if you look at this from afar, you see this rotate like a classical fluid, but on very small scales, you have these individual structures where each of these is essentially a vortex. Okay? So this is a, well, this is a drawing I made, and you might say, well, how do you know this exists? So this is a snapshot of um, this exact same vortex letters in a superfluid um, ultra-cold gas. Okay? So um, in a laboratory system, these uh, things have been created, um, um, how many years ago was that now? About 20, 21 um, years ago. And you basically, what you do is you make a snapshot of, of, your, of your condensate in the lab and you see where there is no, um, where it's dark, that's the center um, of one of your vortices, okay? Well, so this is something like on the order of millimeter scale. So um, if you're a bit dedicated, it will take you about maybe like two minutes to count how many vortices you have in a system like that, okay? You will be done very quickly. In the case of the Newton star, it will take you a very long time because per square centimeter of Newton star interior, we have something like 10 to the five vortices. So it, like a square centimeter is like your, your, your fingernail, okay? So per fingernail, you have that many vortices to get the Newton star rotate at the periods of frequencies that we observe, okay? So that's a lot more than we have in, in laboratory systems, typically. 
Okay, again, this is important for in a bit. The more vortices I have, the faster this thing rotates, okay? So if I have no vortices, zero rotation. If I have two vortices, specific rotation. If I have four vortices, I double that rotation that I have. So um, I said the protons, which was the charged component in the Newton star interior, forms a superconductor. And we do think that it forms a special type of superconductor, namely what we typically refer to as a type two superconductor, where the magnetic field is confined inside vortices. Now they are basically charged, so the picture is very similar to, to here. So you see the same structure reappear here. Um, so you also have this hexagonal structure again, where um, now white means that there is no magnetic field or no flux, whereas black means that there is actually magnetic field assigned to it. So in principle, if you now translate this picture that I heard earlier for the rotation where the more vortices you have, the faster it rotates. Now, the more vortices you have, the larger the magnetic field of the system is. And because Newton stars have what I said earlier is 10 to the 12, now you have per fingernail 10 to the 18 vortices or flux tubes. That's how we sometimes refer to them, okay? So each of them again has a specific um, quantum of flux, that's how we call it, associated with it. And you can basically just count how many you need to get to a specific magnetic field strength. And for the Newton star, that will be something like 10 to the 18, a one with 18 zeros, okay? So that's kind of what um, the comparison to the lab systems typically tells us. And that's what we think is going on. And you might want to ask, um, well, how does, why does this matter? Do you actually observe this? Is there something where you think you are able to probe this kind of behavior using observations that I referred to earlier? And I'm going to talk about one now, which is the final thing we're going to do. Um, that is what we call pulsar glitches. So I said earlier, um, when the Newton star rotates and you look at it for a very long time, its period will increase. So it will rotate slower and slower and slower. That's why I could measure the rate of change of the period, so the derivative of it. Um, and that's what we call a standard spin down. Okay. But if you look at Newton stars for long enough, you will sometimes see them not spin down, but they will suddenly spin up. Okay. So they will exhibit these spin glitches. And in principle, to understand this, you need to combine all the things that I told you about earlier. And um, before we do that, we're going to do this analogy. Okay. I assume you've all seen an egg. Okay, let's take a raw egg, put it on the desk in front of you, and spin it very fast. Then you use your finger, carefully stop the egg, and then you lift your finger up again. Will something happen or will something not happen? Okay, we're going to do this as um, a show of hands. So who thinks nothing will happen? If I stop the egg, then it will just sit there and not move. It's raw. That's important, actually. <laughs> okay, no one thinks that... Yeah, so what would basically happen if I move the finger up is that it will start moving again and rotating again because the egg shell is essentially what I refer to as my crust, whereas the, the liquid in the egg itself still is rotating and has angular momentum, and will transfer that to the egg shell that I've stopped with my finger, and it will start rotating, rota rotating again. If you all go home tonight and try this out, then I think that's already success. <laughs> okay. The same kind of concept happens in a Newton star, okay? So the component that we observe is actually like the outermost layer, so the crust, okay? So this doesn't necessarily mean that um, we don't have any handle of what happens in the core or in the interior, more precisely because we do see these, these glitches, okay? So as I said earlier, the, the star spins down if you look at it for long enough, but then suddenly, this is completely out of scale, this is a very small effect, um, I'm just enlarging this so we can actually see something then it suddenly like spins up and then it sort of like recovers like exponentially. So it like sort of decays back to, to what we started with. So 
that we do observe this um, with radio telescopes again. So one way to do this is like the same analogy as with the egg earlier is I can have an interior component that is rotating faster than my crust. Okay. So if I have something rotating in the core or the somewhere in the interior that's faster than the component I observe, at some point they can recouple or something can happen to like lock those components together. And then I can actually transfer what we call angular momentum from that interior component to the crust component. Okay, and that's what we think we observe. So the way to like do this is related to this picture earlier. I said that the more vortices you have, the faster it's rotating. So in principle, if you want to spin down a superfluid, so make it rotate slower, you have to get rid of vortices of that system. Okay, so you need to like move them outwards and get rid of them at the boundary typically. So the, the thing is, is that you can in principle, it's very much like a tornado, if it hits a house, it might stay there for a while because it has a point of like fixture that it can stay at. The same thing can happen in, in the inner crust, so very like close to this line here, where I actually have a lattice, okay? A lattice point is nothing else than a point where the vortex can sort of like attach itself to, in, in, in a loosely speaking manner, okay? And by attaching these vortices or pinning them, that's what we call that, um, I can prevent them from moving outwards, which means that the superfluid is spinning faster than the component that we observe, okay? And then something happens. I do say exactly the same thing if I give like proper science talks. Something happens because it's magic, no one really knows what's going on, um, that makes these components move together. And we do know how my, much, the, much the spin up is, so we do sort of have a handle on how many vortices are involved in this like um, process. And we do know it's something like 10 to the 13. So that's the one with 13 zeros. Vortices at the same time, there's a huge catastrophic event um, that's happening. So that was sort of from the point of view where I start with um, a microscopic picture and I'm like telling you what happens. But in principle, you can also do this the other way around. So you can observe or use your radio telescope and observe these glitches and then go back and say, well, do I actually understand what that means for the microphysics in the star? So that's kind of one way where you can like try um, uh, a bottom up or a top down approach and you sort of try and like match these two things together. That's one of the main things that I actually try and do. That's my main, main field of work. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that because neutron stars unite that many extremes of physics that we can actually not reproduce on Earth, they are, that was bad timing, awesome cosmic laboratories. Okay, thank you very much. say immediately um, obviously if you're a scientist and you've seen something new the first thing that happens is that someone tells you that's not real and I think that's actually what happened in her case her supervisor said well that's just what we call in yeah well I mean I showed you earlier maybe I can go back to that there's a lot of other things happening in the frequency band that they observe this in so your microwave might look very similar or your telephone belt back then they didn't have Wi-Fi but any kind of like radio wave interferes and shows up on this plot as well um, so obviously um, you have to check first if that's a real signal, but she was like incredibly persistent in going through all these data sets and actually looking at them. And she not only found that, so um, she didn't only find this kind of signal looking in one direction, but she also find them, found them from other directions in the sky. And as soon as you have more than one of these kind of signals, you sort of like start to see a pattern. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean instantly that you know it's a Newton star, but they could figure out that it comes from a very small region of space. Um, and if you start like thinking about the kind of sources that you get in that case, um, 
you don't really have that many options anymore. On top of that, theorists, yay, um, they, they, they did kind of like predict that if you have something that's that compact, rotates and has a magnetic field, you, you must see some kind of radiation from this. Um, and it could be something like a radio pulse. So these ideas had been around beforehand. Um, and well, I always encourage theorists and experimentalists or observers to talk to each other. That's one of the things where that actually is really important. Yeah, there were like ideas around, yeah. I mean, so neutron stars were predicted to exist like f 40 years earlier. So that wasn't like a completely new, new idea. So people knew that, well, hypothesis hypothetically these obje objects should, should exist so you have to sort of like then start to, to say well how could we observe them yeah okay Um, so the first question, um, just to like, so that everyone understands, um, imagine that I have a huge ball of gas um, that's like larger than the sun, but massive, okay? Um, and now I rotate slowly. It's like the, the standard analogy of an ice skater, I'm big. And now I make myself smaller. What happens is that I will start rotating faster, okay? So that's why we think that if you have initially a star that rotates relatively slowly, like the sun, if you make it smaller, you actually um, conserve angular momentum, which means that if you have a smaller object, that it has to rotate a lot faster. Okay, so that's the first thing. That's how you end up with something like millisecond, uh, or yeah, the, the, the periods that I mentioned earlier. Um, so how do you end up having vortices that's not happening instantly, but you have to go through this transition first. So when you make a Newton star, initially it will be relatively hot, okay? It's very much like the, the, the water to, to ice analogy. You have to first cool the star down to get to the point where that new state actually forms, okay? So um, you have to wait for some time, several hundred years in the case of the Newton star, where you have a star that is rotating fast and has no superfluid until you end up with the, the superfluid component. Um, so you have some time to actually like rearrange that. And then the phase transition is essentially um, what dictates that you have to make these vortices on small scales. And on large scales, then it looks like something, something is actually rotating like a fluid ball. Okay, second part of the question. Um, can you just say that again? Oh, yeah. Um, good point. That's actually a very, very good point. Okay, um, where do we have vortex? So, so I said earlier that the fluid itself is inviscid, so it has no friction. It cannot um, uh, sort of couple to anything else, but when it's rotating and it has these vortices, they have normal matter in the interior, that vortex can actually interact with its environment, okay? So it's very much like a vortex running around the countryside and ripping up houses, okay? The same thing happens to, to, to a vortex in the Newton story. So the vortex itself is the, the, the um, component that I need to actually get some kind of coupling going, okay? So without that, it it, there wouldn't be anything happening, okay? Okay, um, so um, basically in this whole supernova process where I like move out outer layers and the, the, the remnant sort of like keeps collapsing and collapsing and collapsing, um, you have um, what we call electron captures. So you combine a proton and a neutron, and an sorry, a proton and an electron to a neutron and a neutrino, but let's forget about the neutrino that can escape. Um, so that is the way of making a lot of neutrons. So the neutron star itself 
once it's like formed, will have about 95% of neutrons. And it has about 5% of protons and similar because they charge neutrons, so you have the same number of electrons, but the electrons have a much smaller mass, so they don't really contribute to the mass of the star. Where the magnetic field come from is a really difficult question and no one really has an answer to that question. So um, in principle, you make a magnetic field, which is what Maxwell's equation tell you, by having particles move. And if particles circulate, you per perpendicular to that, you can make a magnetic field. Okay? So in principle, um, to get this kind of dipole field, what you need, do we have a cross section somewhere? Um, I shouldn't use this. Assume that I have a dipole field that goes out here and here. To get that, you would need a circular flow in the equator. That would mimic your dipole field on large scales. Um, it's not quite clear where these circular currents flow, if they flow predominantly in the crust or if there's also contributions in the core. Um, but we do know that there is probably some, some um, magnetic field component because I did tell you earlier, it has a superconductor and that superconductor is a field in the core. But that's a really important question that no one really has an answer to. Okay, so um, imagine this not as a, like um, uh, an evolutionary diagram where I look at one star and then I track it. This is more like a snapshot in time, okay? At one specific time, these would look like this. So the thing is, if I would look in a thousand years, this would probably still look like this for a lot of cases because the rate of change for these periods is really, 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 really small. Okay, so for, there's actually only like a handful of objects where we think we can maybe see them move in this diagram. But that's just something that's starting to happen because now there's a couple of objects that we have actually observed long enough to actually really measure this accurately. And we have better telescopes as well. Okay, so this is just, um, so they don't necessarily move up here, but they are actually young objects because I said earlier, this is, this is a young, the, the higher this line is, so these are old, these are young. They're actually born up here. So they're born, at, so they have like periods, something like, uh, like 10 seconds. So they rotate relatively slow, but they have huge magnetic fields. And that's why we, well, we like to give things names. That's why we call them magnetars. Magnetars are neutron stars with large magnetic fields. Okay? Okay, um, thank you. Okay, um, well, you might have like, if you have come to any of these talks before, I know that most of you haven't, but I talked a lot about a lot of different things. Okay, there's a lot of different areas of physics that are involved in, in studying these objects. And for some people that might sound daunting, for me, that's the thing that makes them the most interesting objects to study. I love theoretical physics and I love all of the parts of theoretical physics. And that's the kind of object where I can do all of these things together. So I didn't just want to focus on one thing, um, but I wanted to sort of have it all. Um, and uh, doing this um, when you study Newton stars, that's sort of like the, the, the field that, that sort of had that kind of attraction. So that's why I study Newton stars. I'll be here if you have questions. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you very much.